Open your Bibles, please, to the book of John, chapter 2. The book of John, chapter 2. John said that he wrote what he did in this gospel that bears his name in order that we might know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that we might believe on his name and be saved. There is no man so good that he doesn't need to be saved. There is no man so bad that he can't be saved. Wherever you are, I can tell you that without Jesus Christ, the need of your life, the greatest need of your life, is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That does not come about through rituals. It does not come about through religion. It comes about through a personal relationship by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. John says, everything that I've told you about Jesus had a single purpose, and that is to bring you to realize who he is and what he can do. If Jesus is who John says that he is, and let me assure you, he is, then the greatest thing you could do today is put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. John chapter 2, John shows us something that Jesus did that nobody else is able to do. That is, Jesus knows what's in our hearts. What does that do? For you today. The fact that Jesus knows what is in our hearts. Does that somehow encourage you. That he knows my fears. He knows my dreads. He knows my failures. He knows my thoughts. Does that encourage you. Or does this truth. Jesus knows. Does that scare you a little bit. Let's stand together and read our text. From John chapter 2. And we'll start at verse number 23. John chapter 2 and verse number 23. The Bible says, Now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the reading of your word. Our trust, our confidence today is not in the arm of the flesh, but rather today our confidence is in you. We depend upon you to understand, to apply, to receive. Help us to receive the message today as your word. And Father, help us to draw closer to Jesus, to love him more. And if there's one here without Christ, Lord, today in this service, may they come to believe on the name of Christ and be saved. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. If you visited Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, in all likelihood that while you were there, you also visited uh, Arlington National Cemetery, and there you visited the tomb of the unknown soldier. This tomb of the unknown soldier really serves as a monument to all those soldiers whose bodies fell on the battlefield without identification or without recognition. What you may not know is that at the tomb of the unknown soldier, on the western panel of that monument are these words, Here rest in honored glory an American soldier known only to God. There are some things that only God knows. We can hide, we can camouflage, we can cover over, we can put a a veneer on a lot of aspects of our lives, but let me assure you today that you will never be able to hide your thoughts, your motives, your intents, what you really are. You will never hide those from the Lord. He knows all things. Now, in this context, John uh, records that Jesus had just been, was at Jerusalem. And there was, uh, uh, the city of Jerusalem was flooded with millions of people. Maybe two or three million people are now in Jerusalem. Jesus goes into the temple and with holy, righteous indignation, he clears the temple because our Lord said his house is to be a house of prayer, not a house of merchandise, not a place to take advantage of worshipers, but it is a place where we come and we are instructed in the ways of the Lord. And they had perverted all of that, and with righteous fury, he drove out the money changers from the temple. But now we come to that part 
where it says that many believed on him. And the Bible says that Jesus knew what was in man. I want you to look with, these, uh, with me this morning at these verses. In John chapter 2, John opens with a miracle. It is a sign. And Jesus turned the water into wine. And the miracles, the signs. Uh, the, the, by the way, the miracles and the signs save nobody. Nobody is saved because of a miracle. Nobody is saved because of a sign. But it is what it is. It is a sign that points to the fact that only Jesus could do what he just did. By the way, only Jesus can turn water into wine. It is by divine power. It comes out of and issues out of who he is. He is no ordinary man. He is the virgin born son of God. And he inherit in him is divine power to turn water into wine. Our Lord is no ordinary man. Our Lord is the God man. He is God in the flesh. And because of who he is, he can do what he did. Well, John says in this text, in verse 23, that many believed in his name. They saw something compelling and convincing in Jesus. And I would say to you that if you would look honestly today, sir, ma'am, if you would look honestly today at Jesus, that you too would see something in the Gospels about the life of Jesus about his person, about his way, about his mannerism, about his message, about his teaching. That if you would honestly take an honest, long, hard look at the person of Christ, you would come to the same conclusion these people came to, and that is you must believe on Jesus Christ. You see, an honest examination will tell you that Jesus is the Christ the Son of the living God. Now, the Bible says that many believed. This is against the backdrop of the the pilgrims that came to Jerusalem for the Passover. Millions of people are there, and they they encountered our Lord. They saw Him as He uh, cleared the temple. They heard Him when they said, Give us a sign. And He said, You want a sign? Here's the sign. Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. This spake He concerning the temple of His body. I want to tell you, dear one, the resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that Jesus is the Son of God. The most irrefutable fact in the world is the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of our Lord Jesus. It would behoove the enemies of Christianity in the first century to produce the dead body of Jesus. They couldn't produce the dead body of Jesus. There's a reason they could not produce the dead body of Jesus. And that is because his body was dead only three days. And he came out of the grave alive and showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. He's alive. And many now, John says, many, John says, believed on him. Well, Jesus hadn't been in town long. And he's already got adversaries. He's already got those who are opposed to him. Because he has challenged them in their religion. Can I just say this to you? If your religion won't stand a challenge by Jesus, you got the wrong religion. If your religion will not stand up under the scrutiny of the eyes of fire of the Lord Jesus, you've got the wrong religion. And the Jews of the first century had it. And John said that many believed on him. Now look what he says in verse 23. Many believed on his name. When they saw the miracles that he did. They believed on Jesus when they saw. Well, now how many of you have ever seen Jesus perform a miracle? You haven't seen Jesus perform a miracle. Here are people who saw Jesus perform a miracle, and the Bible says they believed on Jesus. But let me tell you something what we have better than seeing Jesus perform a miracle is we have the Word of God that says he did it. Our eyes can fool us. Your eyes ever fooled you? You ever thought you saw something that you really didn't see? Your eyes ever played tricks on you? By the way, the older you get, the more that happens. 
uh, and, and you think you saw something you didn't really see. I, I'm telling you what, we've got something more reliable than our senses, more reliable than our ears, more reliable than our eyes. And what we have that is more reliable than all of that is the Word of God. And it says that He turned the water into wine. It says that He came out of the grave alive. And the Bible says that many believed on Him. Now, if you ask a genuine believer today why they believe on Jesus, they might say, give a lot of different reasons. In fact, why did you believe on Jesus? When you became a Christian, what was your motive? Why did you believe on Jesus? Well, a wife might say, I believed on Jesus because I was married to a no-account kind of man. And then he met Jesus. And Jesus turned my husband into a mean, harsh, critical, fault-finding man. Into a kind, compassionate, caring kind of man. And if Jesus could do that for my husband, I want him to do it for me. A man might say, I chose to believe on Jesus because... I saw him take a, a alcohol out of a man's life and put a Bible in its place. And, and Jesus changed that man. And if he can change him, he would change me. Well, why did you come to Christ? What was your motive in coming to Christ? I want to tell you what my motive in coming to Christ was. I didn't have a lot of gross immoral sins to re repent of. I was only seven, uh, but I was still a sinner. Don't get me wrong. I'll say more about that maybe tonight in our services. Not that you need more about it, but anyway. Um, the Holy Spirit makes us aware of our sin, that we are helpless, that we are hopeless. And I became a Christian, not because I saw what Jesus could do in somebody else's life, but I became a Christian because I saw what I could not do in my own life. Dear one, I would say to you tonight, today, the greatest need of your life is to believe on Jesus Christ, to recognize that you are weak, you are without God, without strength, without help, without hope. And Jesus is the only one who can save you. Amen. See, the Bible says that many of them believed on Jesus. But now I want you to notice in verse 24, what follows this verse, it, it is unexpected and it is somewhat shocking. And I, I want to spend a little time here. Notice what it says in verse 24, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Now there's a play on words here. You, you see in verse 23 it says that they believed on him and then in verse 24 it says that he did not commit himself. That, that, that it's the same Greek word one time it's translated believe one time it's translated commit and what he says is this. They believed on him but he didn't believe on them. There's, there's something going on here. There's something odd, there's something strange, there's something staggering going on when we contemplate the fact that here were people who were believing on Jesus because of miracles, because of what they could see with their eyes. But now he says, though they were believing on Jesus, Jesus was not believing on them. Well, Jesus had no faith in their faith, in Him. I want to say a couple of things this morning about salvation. It is clear that Jesus alone has the power to save. There is no salvation in any name other than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And I want to tell you because Jesus is the only Savior... Jesus is the only one who has a right to determine the conditions of salvation. Would you agree with that? The one that died, the one that was the substitute, the one that paid for our sins, the one who laid down his life for our sins, it is he and he alone who has the right to determine the grounds, the basis of our salvation. And, and, and if Jesus says we've got to, we've got to swim uh, up the Red River in order to be saved, then he's got a right to tell us that. But if Jesus says it is by grace through faith, then Jesus has a right to tell us that too. And I want to tell you that is exactly what Jesus said. No church has a right to determine the way of salvation. Only Jesus does. No denomination has a right to say do this, do this, and do this, and you'll be saved. Only Jesus has a right to tell you how to be saved. And this is what he said. For by grace are you saved through faith. This is what he said. 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. See, I don't have a right. You don't have a right to tell somebody if you want to go to heaven, if you want your sins forgiven, you've got to do this, this, and this in order to be saved. The best we can do, the only thing we can do is tell them this is what Jesus said. He's the Savior. I would never, I would never tell somebody else you need to spank your child. You, you, you need to do something with him. And you know why I wouldn't? They're not mine. But God made the human race. And God has a right to tell us this is the way of salvation. See, what he says about being saved is this. You have to believe. You have to believe in two. The Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. You know, I think sometimes church members are shocked. I think sometimes church members are a little bit unsettled when they come to hear a message and, it, and the preacher says, no, 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 it's, it's not because of who your mom and dad was. It's not because of your goodness. I had a man this last week tell me he was good. And I said, well, what makes you good? And he said, well, it was the way I was raised. But the Bible says there is none good. There is none righteous. No, not one. It doesn't matter who your mom and daddy is. It doesn't matter if your daddy was a preacher. It doesn't matter if you know how to sing. What matters is that there was a point in time when you believe in to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this idea where you've got to say a sinner's prayer. You've got to repeat after me. The Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, I'll take that over some hyper-evangelist any day. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So John says they believe, but Jesus didn't believe in them. Here's what, here's what seems to be going on. Their faith was deficient. There was a fault in their faith. There was, there was something that was not right in their faith. They were believing, but they were, perhaps they were like those in John chapter 6. They were believing not because of who Jesus was, not because of what he did uh, to save them, but they were believing because of the fishes and the loaves. You see, there are miracle mongers in our world today. And they just go from here to there trying to see the next great miracle. They're not really interested in Jesus. They're just interested in seeing something phenomenal, something uh, extraordinary. Uh, they're not really ready or wanting to bow down and submit to the Lordship of Christ. They just want some kind of euphoric spiritual experience. And dear friend, that is not salvation. Salvation is believing in two. Now I'm going to tell you something. I don't believe that I could tell you the words that I said when I received Christ as my Savior. I don't know. I really don't. But I can tell you that I'm saved because I believed in two. I had confidence in, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not saved because of words. I'm saved because of belief. Sometimes people get all upset and concerned about, I don't know if I'm saved or not. I can't remember what I said. Nowhere does the Bible say you have to. What the Bible says is you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've believed on Him, then according to the Bible, you are saved. So they are saved simply because Jesus had mercy on them and they put their trust and faith in him look what he says in verse 24 but Jesus did not did not commit himself unto them they were seeking signs rather than salvation so he says he did not commit himself to them but I want you to notice verses 24 and 25 together now watch this but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men he knew there was a fault in their faith he knew that it was about the miracles not about the salvation he did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that, they, that any should testify of man or tell him what man was thinking. Uh, thinking, Because Jesus already knew that. Now look, look at verse 24. He knew all men. Now this doesn't mean that he knew them the way that we talk about. Somebody says, well, do you know him? Oh yeah, 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 yeah I, know, I know him. Is there anything Jesus doesn't know? Well, no. There's nothing Jesus doesn't know, so it follows that Jesus knows all men. In fact, I would say to you today that Jesus knows you. And by the way, when I talk to you about Jesus knowing all men, I'm not talking about in the con con uh, conglomerate. Uh, I'm talking about the individual. Jesus knows you individually. 
Jesus is not, does not know you just as a part of a mob. Jesus knows you, or a crowd. Jesus knows you individually. Jesus knows you by name. Did you know Zechariah said that he had our names engraved on the palms of his hands? How thoroughly does God know you? He knows every hair on your head. In some cases, the follicles where it used to be hair. <laughs> he knows. He knows you personally, and he knows you intimately. There is nothing Jesus does not know about you. You know, those, those thoughts that, that we have, and, and we think, oh, I better keep it private. I, I better never voice that. I better never demonstrate that. I, I've got to keep this to myself. I, I don't know where that thought came from. Well, you can keep it to yourself. In other words, not blab it. But I want to tell you, the Lord already knows it. He knows every thought that you have ever, ever had. You know what, I won't speak for you, but I'll just speak for me. It is in that line of thought that Jesus knows every thought I've ever had. He knows every motive for everything that I've ever done. And yet he, he still loves me, and I want to tell you that makes me want to shout. Amen. That in spite of all of my thoughts, in spite of all of my um, impure motives, he still loves me. Isn't that something? That he knows you? You, 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 you know those, uh, those thoughts that you've had? You know those things that you thought you did under the cover of darkness? You know those things that you thought you did that nobody ever found out about? Jesus knows. He knows all men. He knows our character. He knows our being. He knows everything there is to know about us. He knows all of our actions. He knows us individually uh, he knows all things the bible says that he knows all men but look again at verse 25 he says for he knew what was in man i don't want to embarrass anybody this morning and certainly don't want to embarrass me Have you ever looked into the eyes of the one you love and say what are you thinking <laughs> oh y'all hadn't okay um what, what about this? A penny for your thoughts? A penny for your thoughts? You, you want to know what somebody else is thinking, and the only way you can know that is what? If they tell you. Jesus never says to you, a penny for your thoughts. Jesus never looks at you and says, what are you thinking? What's on your mind? Jesus never does that, and I want to tell you why Jesus never does that. Jesus never asks a question for information. Jesus asks a question to provoke thought, to stimulate action, but he never asks you a question for, for an answer, for information. The Bible says that Jesus knows what is in man. Do you realize that Jesus sees inside of you? He knows your every thought. He knows your motives. He knows everything there is to know about you. Jesus knows it all. Jesus sees the darkest desires. Jesus sees the greediest goals. Jesus sees the foulest fantasies. Jesus sees the worst wishes of our hearts. And yet our Lord still loves us. In closing, maybe you remember this old song. Amazing grace will always be my song of praise. For it was grace that bought my liberty. I'll never know just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. Folks, that's our only hope right there. That Jesus knows us thoroughly, intimately, more than you can imagine. And yet the one who knows us best loves us most. In that wonderful news, that though we've had thoughts that would embarrass and shame us to no end, He still loves us. Now in this context, look at it. They believed on Him, but Jesus did not commit Himself to them. There was something impure about their faith. It was not for salvation, it was for something extraordinary, a sight, a sign. Friend, I want to tell you, we ought to believe in miracles, but our trust ought to always be in Jesus. You're not saved by a miracle, you're saved by Jesus. And Jesus knew 
why they were believing on him. Jesus knew what their motive was. You know what? Jesus knows yours today. Jesus knows my motive for preaching this sermon today. He knows whether my motives were right, pure, or whether they were sinful and selfish. Jesus knows. Taking that new job, Jesus knows why you did that. Marrying who you married, Jesus knows why. Coming to church today, Jesus knows if it's out of habit or if you've come to worship and praise Him. See, there's nothing beyond the eyes of the Lord. He sees it all. He knows it all. And Here's what I want you to take with you today. That in spite of what may be in your heart, in spite of the thoughts, the motives, Jesus still loves you. He's not throwing you away. He's not finished with you. He wants you to come to believe on Him and be saved. Isn't that wonderful? That in spite of who you are, in spite of what you've done, you can be saved. Because salvation is not based on what you've done in the past. Salvation is based on what you will do with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, right now. Would you trust Him? Believe on Him and be saved. I want us to stand together and bow our heads. In just a moment, we'll have our invitation. And today, if you've come to realize by the convicting power of God's Spirit that you're an unbeliever, you've never been saved. And the Holy Spirit is leading you to respond to this invitation. We want you to come today, receive Christ as your Savior. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Would you do that today? See, friend, what we're doing is just simply asking you to do what God tells us we must do in order to be saved. Would you come to Him today? If you have other spiritual needs, would you respond to God's call, leadership upon your life? Our Father and our God, we thank You that the way of salvation is provided for all men everywhere. And Father, we thank You that all men can be saved if they will believe on the Lord Jesus. If there's one here this morning who does not know Jesus, Lord, we pray that they would believe on Him now and be saved. Father, we pray today that we would not be ashamed of our thoughts and our motives, knowing that You know all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we sing, You come.